this stuff. Okay. So yeah, they started the um, first, second, and third law of thermodynamics, um, but then they realized that all of this was based upon temperature, and temperature was nowhere defined in any of those laws. And they thought, well, heck, you know. And so you'll see this theme throughout this course that once we get a numbering system established, it does more chaotic damage to try to change the numbering system than to uh, adjust a different way. Like, so they could have tried to make the first law now the second law, and the second law now the third law, and so on to make the temperature the first law. Then they didn't want to do that. And so they said, well, let's make temperature the zeroth law. So it's before the first law. So it came later, but it's the zero law of thermodynamics. So that's kind of strange, but that's where that comes from. And, and it's because they don't want to um, have to relabel everything and then there'll be confusion. So this is less confusing in their estimation. So it's, a, it's kind of an interesting scenario. We do this later on with uh, the phases of solid ice. I think it's ice four that they wrote a paper about and everything, and then they realized, no, it's actually the same as ice three, but they had already discovered ice five and six and so on. And so then they just left five and six alone and just said, well, ice four doesn't exist. <laughs> so, so they didn't change the numbering of five and six. So the zero flow of thermodynamics, so I went ahead and highlighted it in red. It was not in red till this morning, but it's when two objects are in thermal equilibrium, they must share a property. And so then temperature is the name we give to that property. Seems just like an innocuous statement, but that's that's sort of what we mean when something's in thermal equilibrium is they share a temperature. Well, what does sharing a temperature do? Well, now that you know the Boltzmann distribution is based upon temperature. And the energy levels are a property of the system. So think of the particle in a box. You give me a mass, you give me a size of confinement, and I know where the energy levels are. But I don't know what temperature we're at. See the difference? The energy levels are a property of the system. The temperature is how that system is populated. So, so that's where the thermal equilibrium is, is tied really to that temperature. So from temperature we get the, the Boltzmann distribution, and then the Boltzmann distribution is the foundation of partition function, U shag and equilibrium. All of that. Think about every equilibrium system in the whole world, universe. You know, that all of that is based upon U shag, which is based upon the partition function, which is based upon temperature. So you change that temperature and everything shifts around. So we've had kind of a mess of temperature over the over the centuries, if you think about it. I mean, how many temperature scales can you come up with? What are the three? Kelvin, Celsius, Fahrenheit. There's, um, yeah, that's pressure. But you're right, pressure has more. Pressure has many more. Um, and there's one other, it's not Rankin. It's, Somebody Google Rankin, not Rankin. Uh, there's a fourth temperature scale. I came across it. It was an engineering temperature scale. I was like, what is this craziness? Yeah. Anyway, it's not very common at all. Um, but, but let's say you're working in Fahrenheit and uh, you want to come up with a better temperature scale that's based upon something that's common like water. And so how do you come up with the divisions, right? So they said... Let's, let's just set it to water to where boil, uh, freezing water is zero and boiling water is 100. And we have 100 units in between, so that's also called centigrade. So 100 grades. So it's 100 divisions between boiling and, and freezing. And then the, in honor of uh, Paracelsus, they gave that term Celsius as that temperature scale. But if we go through this, if we go through this uh, little experiment, and I've always wanted to do this but I've never done it. If we, if we measure the volume, so we have a balloon, we could just like stick it down in a five gallon bucket, okay, of ice water. Um, and then we could mark the displacement. So we measure the, the, um, the volume of the balloon is here. 
and then we put it in a five gallon bucket that's warm water and measure the volume. It's going to be a larger volume. It's going to expand a little bit. So let's say it's right here. And then we extrapolate that to where the volume goes to zero. And then we do the experiment with a smaller balloon. We get, you know, we get our two data points here, here and here. Extrapolate that to where the balloon goes to zero. We get the same temperature. It's kind of bizarre if you think about it. So this, this always hits the same point at minus 273. 0.15 if you want to be precise. And so instead of having negative temperatures, we just move zero over here. So that's why Celsius and Kelvin have the same gradient. They have the same temperature between two tick marks, if you will. We just move the intercept so that we don't have any negative temperatures. Does that make sense now? Now you know how they're connected and why you just convert from one to the other by adding or subtracting 273.15. Because nature doesn't consider water really special, <laughs> right? So our Celsius was based on water, which is fine. Okay, we kept the same 100 degree difference between boiling and, and, and uh, freezing water because um, nature doesn't also know about temperature differences um, in terms of the numbers we assign to it. But there is a, an absolute temperature that's absolute zero in nature that we can't go below. And so this would be an extrapolation of these volume measurements down to zero. You could do the same thing with pressure. You put it in a stainless steel container and heat it up and look at the pressure, cool it down, look at the pressure. Where pressure goes to zero would be absolute zero. Now we have to do this extrapolation because if we really do cool things down, then they're no longer gases and they become liquids and they become solids and those volumes and so on, are, are they don't go to zero. So volume doesn't actually go to zero. It's an extrapolation. So we look at this ideal gas type region and then we extrapolate down to where it goes to zero. <clears throat> and so this is just what we've, we've called absolute zero. And so let's take a little brief tour of temperature. I've got this temperature scale over here on the, on the right, and it's a logarithmic scale. And so it's got some of the, um, you know, the things that we're familiar with. We've got this tiny little band in the middle where water is liquid, pretty much a requirement for life. So we live in this temperature range here. Um, we cool it down. We've got the boiling point of oxygen. We've got the boiling point of heat, heat, helium. We've got down here uh, just above thousand Kelvin that's the average temperature of the universe it doesn't really mean anything but that's like the stars are really hot and space is really cold and so you average those together and that's what they they've got marked on here um, down here at really cold temperatures they have helium being a superfluid and that is a strange little state of matter uh, that was hypothesized to exist and then they cooled helium down uh, helium three in particular and they saw that it that it um, actually occurs so what is a superfluid? It's it, first of all, what's a fluid? It's a, it's a dense state that has a meniscus, right? So you have a gaseous state and a, and a dense state, and that state has a meniscus between the gaseous state and the liquid state. So when there's a meniscus, you've got a liquid. It's another way of identifying if you have a liquid, right? You look in this vial, is there a liquid? What are you looking for? You're looking for the meniscus, right? And, and, and a superfluid has a, a surface with no surface tension. So the, the glass, if you look in a glass capillary or in a beaker, the glasses, uh, the water and the glass are attracted to each other. And so over at the edge, you see the meniscus go up the glass. The reason it doesn't keep going up the glass is because it takes energy to make the surface. So there's an energy penalty for climbing the walls. It's not just gravity, it's, it's, it's an energetic thing. Uh, if there was no uh, surface tension to water, it would climb all the way up the walls because you're not lifting that much mass. Okay, so it would it would just creep along the walls, and uh, and you would have a meniscus. If the whole container was glass, it would go all around all the surfaces, and you'd have a meniscus in the middle, and that's what the helium superfluid looks like. So when they cool it down and they're looking through the window, 
that goes from a gravity bound meniscus to a liquid that wets the surface and has a little meniscus in the middle. So anyway, I thought that was cool. And so then if we go to hot temperatures, um, we get up to, you know, hot temperatures like boiling metal or boiling mercury and just other metals that boil higher. Then you have the, like the surface of the sun, which I don't exactly know what they mean by surface of the sun. It's not a solid. So I don't exactly know when you hit the surface of the sun. But you have the solar corona. Um, that's, that's where the light is being emitted from, this hot area where uh, electrons, uh, you've got ionized atoms and a gas of ionized atoms and electrons, and those electrons are hitting those atoms and getting captured by the electron cloud. It's a positive charged nucleus. You have an electron. They bounce down through all of the uh, d orbitals, p orbitals, and so on, and when they do that, they emit light. And so we're getting all of those um, light-emitting transitions in the visible region in, in the corona of the sun. Then we get down inside the core of the sun and the, the core of a, a red giant star. So we're up here, this is a million Kelvin, 10 million Kelvin, 100 million Kelvin. So all of these up here would be you know, fusion temperatures. And so that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to reach millions of degrees we can do it with nuclear detonations very easily. We just can't really control it. Okay. And it's illegal now. But we used to just do this all the time. They'd set off a hundred of them in a couple of weeks in the Nevada desert and make measurements and so on. So it's kind of an interesting thing, making measurements on nuclear devices. They would, they would have, for the underground ones, they would have a stack of, you know, control, you know, cables and everything. They go down and, and detonate the device. But they would also have uh, spectrometers. So the light traveling faster than the shock wave would come blasting out of the device and hit our spectrometers a few, you know, nanoseconds or milliseconds before the spectrometer is destroyed. So, so light travels through this stainless steel site to gives us our data. The data goes to the surface a real short uh, distance through cables and then microwave um, sends it to our data collection system at the bunker. And then the shockwave destroys all that equipment. And it's just so sad. Uh, you get this really high resolution spectrometer that you build, you put it on a nuclear device, and then you blow it up. <laughs> and you get all the data out, and then you have to build another spectrometer because you just destroyed it. Yeah. And then they go back and they dig into the ground and find um, you know, all the daughter elements and everything and, and determine what the yield was and all of that. So that's how they do. That's why they did so many underground nuclear detonations. Yes, it was to make more efficient bombs, but it's also to study the nucleus and the different processes. And when you take a nuclear device and you press on um, like a solid form of hydrogen. So how would we make a solid form of hydrogen? Really cold. You could do that with cryogenics. But what other ways would we might make a solid form of hydrogen? Can we put hydrogen on something? That's solid. Liquid will work too, but solid is even more dense. And so solid means it's better. You make liquid hydrogen by cooling it down. And that was some of the first hydrogen bombs was liquid hydrogen. Made. Have you ever heard of hydrides? Okay, describe to me what a hydride is. What does the IDE tell you about it? Huh? What is a chloride? What does the IDE mean on chloride? What's the difference between chloride and chlorine? Negative charge. Negative charge. Exactly. So when you have a hydride, the hydrogen is acting as the anion. So you can put it on any cation. If you can get the hydrogen to act like an anion, you can put it on any cation. And now you have a salt, which typically is solid. You can dry it out and make sure it is solid. And so they, um, they put it on lithium. So lithium hydride, or if they make heavy hydrogen, lithium deuteride, is a great source for fusion fuel. And if you can press on that solid, you can get the hydrogens to fuse with each other. The two deuteriums to fuse and make a helium nucleus. 
And so that's the, the idea of fusion. So they were doing that in the nuclear weapons as well. So they knew that, that they could get lithium deuteride to fuse. And so then that's what the Livermore National Ignition Facility is doing. So this NIF right here, that's, that's what's happening with the uh, lithium deuteride. And then there's the Sandia Z machine. And so uh, this, we'll get to those in a second. So let's go down to really low temperatures. So, so far the, the um, well, I don't have the record on here. Uh, I think they're down to 100 nano Kelvin. I mean, they're really, really low temperatures. Now, how can you cool things down? Well, you need to start with enough material so that you can evaporate it. So when you, when you evaporate a liquid or a gas, if you'd be like let the mainly liquid. So let's take about a, talk about a liquid. This is the, the molecular speeds at given temperatures. And notice down here in the corner, there in any, in any sample, there are really cold molecules. Like in this room, the average temperature is, you know, 70 degrees Fahrenheit or so. But there are some molecules in this room that are incredibly slow. And velocity is, is related to temperature. It's that translational energy. So you could come up with the energy. You could just take the, the kinetic energy. Y'all remember the physics equation for kinetic energy, like a baseball? One half m v squared, right? And then what's the translational energy, the internal energy? We, we had the translation, rotation, vibration. So translation, let's say um, we had three different directions. And I know we focused on heat capacity. So tell me the heat capacity. Just translation for a gas, like a helium. Yeah. Three halves, NR, yeah. Well, three halves, um, and we'll just say it per mole, so we'll leave it R. And then that's the heat capacity, which was the slope of the energy. So that's the slope. Of the energy with respect to temperature and so that's the internal energy so this is u on this side and so if you've got a really 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 small velocity you've got a really 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 small temperature so right down here is super cold and so if you can take your gaseous atoms or molecules and put them in a vacuum and confine them to space and let just the hotter ones leave, you can keep hold of those cold ones. Make sense? Okay. And so they can confine them with magnetic fields and lasers and all kinds of crazy things and let the hotter molecules evaporate. And then they get to these, the, the idea is to let's, let's get down here to the cold temperatures where we see quantum effects. This is why this is so interesting to physicists and physical chemists like me. We have, we see vibrational quantum effects all the time, right? There's particular transitional frequencies. That's that discrete absorption. We see rotational effects, carbon monoxide, right? The, the rotational uh, quantized jumping. It wasn't a smooth transition where it could absorb just any energy and go into rotation. It could only absorb packets of 2B spaced energies. So those are quantum effects. We can't see translational quantum effects because we have 10 to the 30 energy levels populated at room temperature. But remember, if we cool it down, we did that little calculation in the notes. What temperature would quantum effects emerge? When would it become like a two-level system where the, the atom is moving really slowly or jumping really fast and nowhere in between? Weird. Right? Can you imagine? That'd be a heck of a car to drive. Right? You just barely give it enough gas and all of a sudden you're going 60. And you don't want to go 60, you want to go 30. But sorry, the properties of the system say you can go 0, 60, 120, and that would be bad. <laughs> right? But that's, that's what quantum mechanics predicts, that translation should be quantized too. 
and and can we see it is the question. Can we get down cold enough where we see translational quantum effects? And that's one of the things that these Bose-Einstein condensates are trying to do. So that's the super cold region. And then uh, let's go to the, the super hot region. So this is the, the nuclear uh, binding energy or stability of the nuclei. And so if we do everything relative to iron, then making iron the sort of the, the most stable nucleus, and we plot all of the others in terms of their stability relative to iron. You can see here's lead 207, here's uranium 235. So this dis difference over here is the nuclear fission distance, like how much energy we get out of nuclear fission. And we know that's enough to power power plants and, and so on. But look over here, this going from hydrogen to helium, that's the di nuclear fusion power. So you can see why we would ra rather use nuclear fusion. In terms of the amount of energy we get out of it, it's many, many times more. Okay, so that's pretty amazing. And so that's why, and, and also this, because this, this curve is not just like a linear curve where, um, you know, all the nuclei behave the same, uh, it's got this dip. I never as a kid understood how can you get energy out of splitting an atom and energy out of combining atoms. Right? That doesn't make sense. But it does if you don't have a linear curve. If you've got a curve with a dip in it and you're heavier than the stable nuclei, you can split those unstable nuclei to get closer to the stability range. And if you're lighter than the stable nucleus, you can combine light nuclei and get closer to the stable range. And you can get energy out of both ends. And so what we have to do is use nuclear fission. Well, in the past, we used to have to use nuclear fission to create enough pressure to fuse atoms. And so we would we would use one to cause the other. And that's how a nuclear bomb works. We use a fission bomb to press on lithium deuteride to make fusion work. But that's the only thing at, to this point that we could use that could get it to that high a temperature. Okay, so then uh, this tremendous amount of energy stored in the nucleus um, is related to this the stability of each nuclei. So if you do this reaction and you look up the isotopic masses of deuterium and the isotopic mass of helium, there's mass missing. So we just said that the conservation of mass, you know, the law of conservation of mass is, is one of our thermodynamic laws. Um, and so this delta M is the mass of the products minus the mass of the reactants. And so in this particular reaction, we have two deuterium masses and a helium four net mass and this is the amount of mass missing. And so that's a, that's a lot, actually. I mean, it doesn't look like a lot, 0 0.02 grams per mole. Okay. But if we use E equals mc squared, that's 2 times 10 to the 12th joules per mole. That's ridiculous. That is a ton of energy. And so that's, if you have, um, that's like, 548 billion joules per gram of deuterium. <laughs> a gram. And that'll give you, that's, so that's, compare that to a, a ton of oil. So, so like 2,000 pounds of oil only gives you 45 billion joules. <laughs> a gram of hydrogen can give you 10 times more than a ton of oil. So that's, if we fix, like, if we figure out how to do this, there is no, there is no energy problem. And we'll, we'll cover this in more depth near the end of the semester when we get into energy. But I just wanted to talk about fusion because it requires such a high temperature. And today we're talking about temperature. So how do we get to these high temperatures? Well, this is a creative way to do it. This is the Sandia uh, Z-pinch machine. Z being the, what they label as the direction of, like, a magnetic field. You know, so... That's why they call it the Z machine. They have these gold wires here. This person's making the little target chamber. And these gold wires, let's just draw over here. So like uh, in these two wires, there's a bunch of them. So we have the current, oh my gosh, that's, that's supposed to be straight. Okay, so current. No, not, not the not the berry. Yeah. 
Okay, so the current going in that direction, we got left now. Okay, so then you have the right hand rule, right? So if, if current's going along my thumb, there's a magnetic field going around my fingers. Okay, so electric, you know, you've got a current going in one direction, the, the charge traveling in that current, as it ramps up to speed, it creates a magnetic field. And then if we have a wire going in the, with current going in the opposite direction, it's a little bit. So this one creates a little magnetic field around there, and this one creates a magnetic field going in the opposite direction. Those magnetic fields have a, have a north-south, we'll just call this a little magnet with north here, and then this produces a magnetic field with north here. So you've got two magnet, magnetic fields that are attracted to each other. And so that's going to move those wires together. Okay? And you could put a target in the middle, like a lithium deuteride tablet, and slam this, this metal. Now, how do we get um, a really controlled substance here? We make these out of gold. Okay. And gold is great because it's a heavy atom. Now, we put so much current through these wires that they evaporate. So we just blast the current through the wires evaporate, but the cool thing is the magnetic field is set up instantaneously before they evaporate. So the gold atoms get this magnetic field, they're attracted to the other wire, they evaporate and all the atoms are moving. Isn't that cool? So we like blow this wire up and it has a pulse of, of momentum towards all the other wires. We set it up in a ring and they all slam together in the middle. And so we're trying to compress something. So, so far, they've just worked with the wires. They haven't put the target in. But they could put a lithium deuterium uh, target in the middle and have this gold slam into the lithium and deuterium and create a fusion, potentially, fusion reaction because of the momentum of the gold. Think about how small and light lithium is and deuterium are. You know, so that gold slamming into them would really be like bowling balls hitting billiard balls attached to ping pong balls. So... The billiard ball is the lithium, the ping pong ball is the hydrogen, and you've got bowling balls coming in, slamming into that mess. And maybe you could overcome the repulsion of the nuclei and get fusion to happen. So they got up to 1.6 million degrees with this. And this is what the experiment looks like. Okay? So this right here, these, this thing right here is a, like an ultra capacitor. So they charge that thing up for... I don't know, I think it's like days. They sip on the, the power grid and charge these capacitors up over day, several days, and then they release all the electricity in a few milliseconds. And so all these capacitors shove all of that electricity through the gold wires. Now, you, you know, you always have two poles, right? You have, say, a positive pole and the negative pole is attached to ground. And so all these capacitors are attached to ground. And so you, you always have leakage in any electrical circuits and the ground has to take away some of this, this voltage. And that, that fuzz on top, that's all lightning on the surface of the cooling pool. This generates so much, so much heat that you've got to have water cooled or you melt all of your circuits and everything. And so they, they've got all of these ultra capacitors. They fill this room with DI water or some kind of special water. And so all of this thing is underwater and then they make it go, and this is a picture of what the room looks like. So this is like a ladder. All the metal objects are at ground, and so this is just waste electricity going to any ground point and, and coming out of the room. So anyway, it's a really impressive picture. They haven't gotten as far as Livermore, and I know that Sandia and Livermore love to compete with each other, so this is like this latest announcement really tightens Sandia's jaw. But here's the Livermore National Ignition Facility where they use lasers. And I think I talked about this on the laser lecture in the fall, uh, or in Pekin 1, but, but they have the, the main beam amplified. All this is in infrared light. And then they get down here and they convert it to visible light. So it goes from uh, 1064 to 532 uh, nanometer light, which is green. And then it goes to 266, which is UV. And all of that hits this tiny little target. 
And so the, the target chamber has a thing called a hole ROM, which uh, the lasers go inside the cylinder and hit the inside surface of the cylinder. And they, they again, that they, they basically evaporate the metal and, and it can, collides with the deuterium pellet and creates fusion. And so this past December, so December 14th, they made the big announcement that they actually got fusion ignition. So they didn't just compress the deuterium tablet to uh, get close to fusion. They actually saw more energy come out of the tablet than went into the hull run. So that's when they say they got positive energy balance. So they put this much light in with this energy and they got slightly more energy out of the fusion. Sounds great, but they didn't get, so they got energy balance right here. <laughs> okay, so this is, this tiny little target was more E out than E in. And that's a great achievement. Congratulations. But they didn't take into account this E in. Okay. And and but that's for a power plant, that's what you would need to do. Okay. And so but but I'm not gonna, you know, throw shade on what they've accomplished, but I'm just saying when it says positive energy balance, you've got to see where what are they using, what numbers are they using? They're using the energy of the laser at the last step going into the little deuterium tablet and the laser that came out of that tablet. Now, if you can get more, maybe you can cover the amplifiers. And then if you get more, maybe you can cover the original. And then eventually you're making excess energy and you've got a ability to turn that into some form of sellable energy and you've got a power plant. Yeah. So this is pretty exciting. This is a picture of the nuclear, a nuclear device going off, again, a fusion reaction. And how is it that we can visualize this? Well, the, the fireball may expand roughly at 10 kilometers per second, okay? So that's, if you look at this, you see kind of a square here. You see that square? I'm not making that up, I don't think. Can you see that? And you have kind of a, a some kind of seam here and you've got a square there. That's the shape of the building the device was in. So that is the that is the vaporized tin, like the metal walls of this building coming out. And of course, in the corners you had iron I beams, and so they didn't evaporate as fast. So the the the, the weak walls evaporated first. Here's the evaporated iron structure coming out. Um, that shock wave is going through that you know through air now, and so it's you know it's really slowed down because the air doesn't you know air is more sparse, and so those those shock waves are, you know, creeping through air. Um, think about the speed of sound through through water travels faster. The speed of sound through metal even faster. And so the shock wave travels faster through through the metals. And so these right, these little spikes coming out here, those are the guy wires that are holding this tower up. And so the shock wave is run, is flying through this this uh, cable and evaporating it as it goes. So this is the evaporating cable. That's what those spikes are. So you're looking at the what's called a rapidtronic image. They spun this mirror really fast, and they had unexposed film. And so they get the thing spinning, they detonate the device, and they get like six pictures at like a you know nanosecond apart or something. And so that's how they got these really fast pictures. Uh, how was their uh, how was the light able to get there? Well, the light's traveling you know, like 30,000 times faster than the shock wave. And so the shock wave moves another nanosecond and emits light and that light's going 30,000 times faster than the shock wave. And so you can get these pictures. And so that's what's going on. Um, I talked about the, comp the competition between uh, Sandia and Livermore and these national labs really compete against each other. And one, one year, uh, uh, I think it was Livermore, yeah, because they're the pompous ones. They they tested the device and it didn't detonate, okay, and it was a fizzle. And so then the like director of Sandia uh, wrote a letter to the Department of uh, 
I think at the time it was the Atomic Energy Commission, and said, oh, we've got a cost saving plan that would you let us use Livermore's towers when they're done with them? Because <laughs> <laughs> normally the towers evaporated, right? <laughs> so there's nothing left. This is the building down here where the like the signals, like the power, like the the measurement devices, like they come down and they hit that building and then microwave energy sends it out, you know, to the control center. And then that building's destroyed. You know, look, it's right, ground zero. It's going to just be destroyed. But if there's a fizzle, then none of that's destroyed. And that was a real dig. Anyway, let's finish up with some more basic terms and concepts. So now we're changing, changing from statistical thermodynamics, where we talked about the partition function, we are leaving that behind. Okay. So from this point in the course until the final, when you have a little bit of questions, you know, review on the, on the partition function, Q means heat. So we're stepping over the threshold, we're in a different room now. And in this room, Q means heat. And so I, I you know, I, I can't really control the terminology. These are so, sort of different fields. So they both, two different fields use Q in different ways. So this is traditional thermodynamics and heat is, for whatever reason, they chose Q for heat. And it's the heat moving to, into and out of a system and it's measured using temperature. We typically put something in equilibrium with the system that we want to measure the temperature, and that's thermometers or thermocouples or something like that. So we need, we need good contact with the system we're measuring, and heat flows through diathermic walls and not through adiabatic walls. Heat can be used to increase the system's capacity to do work, and that's a definition of energy. So that red text there... Energy is defined as the capacity to do work. And we see that the heat capacity has those uh, um, units of energy per Kelvin. So how much energy can I put in a system before its temperature goes up a degree? And if you've got a larger heat capacity, like water has a huge heat capacity, I can store more energy in water than I can, say, stainless steel, which has about one-seventh of the heat capacity of, of water. And then when the system changes, of course, you can absorb heat, which is endothermic, and release heat is exothermic. Um, well, on that test question, that was a little, that was a trickier question than, than it looked. It's just like a two-option two question. Um, a couple of you said it's exothermic. I saw your notes because of delta G, when exothermic is really delta H. So even though you weren't required to calculate delta H in there, to answer that question, you had to calculate delta H. So you may not have and just got lucky, <laughs> right? But if you wanted to prove to yourself it was exothermic, you would have to calculate delta H and see if it was negative, if, if the system lost energy. We'll get into that some more with all of these, this section of the class. So here's the diathermic walls. So anything that's dense, like a metal or glass, they're good heat conductors. Okay. So diamond is probably, it's, it's not the most dense material, but it's definitely the like, most rigid material. It's one of the hardest materials. And the, the reason it conducts heat so well is there's really, um, uh, there's no flexibility in, in the diamond crystal structure. Have you, have you seen the diamond crystal structure? It's just tetrahedral carbon atoms all connected to each other. So, you know, you, you bump one of those atoms on the surface and it, and it goes, the energy goes right through the, the crystal structure. And so that's great for cutting tools. If you're scraping or whatever cutting, they put diamond coating on the metal so that the heat is conducted across the surface and spread over the metal. The, the tip of the of metal tools will dull as they get hot. They'll basically melt right at the tip. And so you can sharpen the metal, start cutting, and it gets dull right away because the tip is, is heating up quite a bit. And when it gets too hot, it softens and becomes dull. If you put diamond over that tip, this, the heat will flow through the diamond and not into the metal and it will divide it out. It's kind of like if you're standing on uh, a squishy surface 
and you put a piece of plywood down. So you're standing on the plywood, which distributes your mass. So that's what diamond does with heat. It distributes the heat. So when the heat's trying to go in and make your tools dull, you put a diamond coating down. It's like you're standing on a piece of plywood on mud. So the heat goes through the through the diamond and goes slowly into the metal and you don't get a dull tool. <clears throat> if you want good insulation, you need non-dense things and the least dense thing is a vacuum. If you can remove all the mass, you have volume and no mass, so you have really no density. And so that's great. So that's what our Dewar thermoses are, our Yeti cups, things like that. The, the insulating value of this mug is related to how good a vacuum there is in the middle of it. It's a double walled container with a vacuum. So that's what makes it a, a good thermos. And, and it just resists heat flow. So there's nothing uh, magic about it. That it, it. It seems magic. It keeps the hot things hot and the cold things cold, right? And the fellow says, but how does it know? <laughs> right? Well, it's not a knowing thing. It just doesn't transfer heat into or out of the thing. So this person said, that's fantastic. This keeps the hot thing hot and the cold thing cold. And so they put coffee in there, and then they put uh, their uh, lunch, and then they put like their dessert and pudding, and they were expecting it to keep the pudding cold and the coffee hot. The, the point is not in the same container. Like you can't put everything in there hot and cold and have it keep the hot things hot and the cold things cold. So that's a that's a misleading deal. Now, why do we like you know spun fibers, fiberglass, uh, feathers? You know, why do those things insulate so well? And this is the last question. Stick with feathers, okay? Why do feathers insulate so well? You can't pack them. You can't pack them into a small space. So all those little feathery fibers, they're, they're fairly strong. And so you smash them down and they spring right back, okay? And they just keep, they just keep the volume large and the mass is small. And, and so for heat to go from one side to the other, it, it can go through the air or it can go through the fiber, like the carbohydrate fiber or the protein fiber. If it's a feather, it's going to some protein. It can go down the length of the protein and it gets to the end of the feathery part. And it's like, well, what now? Right. I'm barely touching this other feather so I can maybe hop over to that other feather or it can go through the air. And air is a really good insulator. And so in those jackets, it's really the f spun fiber or the feathers are really just to keep the walls of the jacket apart. And it's really air that's conducting the heat. So if you could fill those jackets with uh, something like argon, which is a really slow gas, you could have an argon filled jacket, it would really have a high insulating value. It'd be really expensive and you couldn't poke a hole in it. Uh, helium is the fastest noble gas. And, and so you would not want to fill your jacket with helium. One, it would, it would float away if you dropped it. But two, uh, it would conduct heat really well. So the lighter, the faster the molecule going from one wall to the other, the faster the heat transfer. And so helium's a terrible gas for heat transfer. Argon's a better gas. And that's kind of counterintuitive because argon's heavier. And so you would think that the density would make argon a better. Uh, wait, no, that works. No. No, helium's better for, for heat transfer. So it's the least dense. But for like physical substances, like solids, uh, density conducts, conducts heat.